My name is Patrick Bose. I'm a research specialist with NDSU Extension Entomology. Today I'm going to talk about tips for taking quality diagnostic photos using a smartphone. Here are some different cameras. The camera on the left is an old friend of mine. It's a Nikon 8008 film camera. And you can see some color slides arrayed below the camera itself. The camera at the center top is a digital camera. The difference is, is that instead of capturing the images on film, the images are captured via an electronic sensor. That electronic sensor is covered with millions of little photosensitive cells called pixels. And the camera assigns numeric values to those pixels and stores them on a memory card. So that's what a digital image is. What you're actually looking at here is a visual representation of those numbers for those tiny little pixels. It's really amazing technology. Uh, memory is stored via a couple of different memory cards. The one on the left with the red stripe on it is called a compact flash card. And that compact flash card can store about 16 gigabytes worth of data. They're not used all that much anymore. The one on the right with the gold stripe is called an SD card, and that's the most commonly used storage medium for digital cameras. That little card can hold 256 gigabytes of data, and that's roughly equivalent to 250,000 color slides. That little point and shoot camera at the top there is about a six megapixel cam uh, sensor on it. The camera on the right is my main photography camera. It's a Nikon D300S digital SLR, and it functions almost exactly the same as the film camera on the left, the difference being that instead of using film, the images are captured and stored digitally. I can put a number of different lenses on that camera, macro lenses for close-up, telephoto lenses, zoom lenses, wide-angle lenses. It's a really, really good camera. And that one's got about a 14 megapixel sensor. But what we're going to focus on today is using a smartphone camera. The, the phone pictured here is the iPhone 7 Plus. And if you look at the top left of the phone, you'll see a kind of a dark oval. There are two lenses behind that oval. There's a kind of a normal lens and a telephoto lens. And behind those lenses is a 12.2 megapixel sensor. So that iPhone camera is almost as good as that Nikon on the right. Now that iPhone is more than a phone, it's more than a camera, it's a miniature computer. And so it can capture high quality images and just with the click of a few buttons, I can send those images anywhere in the world in just a matter of seconds. So if I'm taking a, an image of a, a, say a pest or a disease problem, I can capture that image and send it off via email to a diagnostician and hopefully get a reply within minutes instead of having to develop film, send it in, wait for a reply, a process that could take as much as a week. So using your phone for diagnostic photos is a very, very powerful tool. Now I've been talking about pixels. What exactly are pixels? Again, those are those little tiny, tiny squares on the photoelectric cell, the sensor in the camera. And that translates into an image that you will see on your computer screen as something you can print. The big image here, this is a buck moth that's feeding on willow. And this is kind of a typical diagnostic photo that we would get. What is this? Is this a problem? Let's just look at the image itself. This image is 3,872 pixels wide by 2,592 pixels tall. And if you multiply those two numbers together, what you get is a little bit over 10 million pixels that make up that image. Now that, those pixels are assigned numeric values based on three different colors, red, green, and blue. And each one of those colors can have at least 256 values. So what that means is that each of those little tiny pixels can have one of almost 17 million different colors assigned to it. To illustrate that, what I've done is I've shrunk the image down to only 300 pixels wide by 200 pixels tall. That's the one in the top right. That's a pretty small image. 
Uh, for diagnosis, we'd like those bigger images, not the smaller ones. Then what I've done is I've taken that small image and I've blown it up. So you can actually see the individual pixels that make up the image. Those tiny little squares, each one of them has its own color associated with it. And it's that mosaic that you can't see with the naked eye in the big picture that renders that nice color photograph. It really is amazing technology. Now let's talk just a little bit about image size and file size. And this is really important for our iPhone or Android phone, whatever phone you're using. Uh, some phone cameras can shoot in a file format called TIFF, that's tagged image file, and that is the very highest quality. So if you have a 12 megapixel sensor, the file size would actually be 36 megabytes. That's a big file. It's 12 megapixels times one byte per color channel. That gives us our 36 megabytes. Now, the limiting factor of phones is they don't have near the storage space that, say, a laptop computer does. You can use cloud storage with your phone, but it's a service that you'll have to pay for. Also, if you want to send that image, 36 megabytes is too big to send. Here at NDSU, even on our, our email system on campus, 25 megabytes is the biggest file that we can send. So there has to be some kind of a compromise. Enter the JPEG format. All digital cameras are capable of storing images in this format called JPEG. And what it basically is, is it's that big TIFF format and it's compressed down to a small size. So in this case, that 36 megabytes is compressed down to around two megabytes. Now that's a file size that's small enough to be sent easily, but still retains very good detail. The image on the right is about two megabytes in size. It's a JPEG file. Take a close look at that bird. It's a bird called a Nashville warbler. And you can see the detail of the feathers, particularly the yellow around the body, that little rusty patch up on top of the crown, even the grays on the head, you can see the detail of the feather. It's a very good photo and that's small enough to be sent either via email or text messaging. Now phones also have what's called a high efficiency format, HEI or HEV for image or video. Uh, these are lower quality than JPEG, um, probably a little half, less than half the quality I would say. And these are used to save on memory space within the phone itself and also to save on data usage. And keep in mind that with your phone using cellular data, you have a data plan, you're probably limited as to how much data you can send and receive. So we do need a compromise between super high quality and something that isn't so good. And so we want to use that JPEG format. So we suggest that you use the largest JPEG format that your camera supports or that your phone supports. Okay, I'm gonna pause briefly here and walk through some phone settings on the iPhone to make sure that you are in fact sending the highest quality image that you can. And I apologize in advance, I'm doing this just for the iPhone. I'm not doing this for any of the phones that use the Android operating system. And that's gonna vary between phone and phone anyhow. But the principles I'm gonna talk about here are just the same. Okay, here's my home screen on my iPhone. I'm just going to go into settings. I'm going to scroll down to my camera, select my camera. I'm going to go to formats. You can see I have two different formats. I have the high efficiency that I talked about earlier, and then I have most compatible. The most compatible is the one that uses JPEG. So I wanna make sure that I have that selected. Another handy item is this grid. If your camera has that, what this does is it basically puts a tic-tac-toe square across the viewfinder of the screen of your camera and it will help you to compose your image. I like to keep that on. Okay, I'm gonna go back. Now, if I'm sending via text message, 
because of the data usage and data restrictions on the phone, I may have this at the very bottom here. It says low quality image mode. If that is on, then the, when I send a photo via text message, it will be sent as a very low quality and that's to save on data usage within your data plan. Now for diagnostic photos, we want the higher quality photos. So make sure that that is turned off. Lastly, check the email that you're using. I don't use the native Apple mail app, I use Outlook. And in my Outlook account, I don't have any restrictions on data usage. So when I send a photo via my phone using Outlook, it will send the high quality image. Okay, I'm going to pause again and resume some slides. Okay, I just wanna talk briefly about zoom, optical zoom versus digital zoom. Our smartphone cameras are not capable of optical zoom. There was an older galaxy that had a telescoping lens, but it never really caught on. Uh, what optical zoom is, in this image you can see, I have a, a zoom 28 to 105 millimeter zoom lens attached to my camera. What optical zoom does is it repositions the elements of the lens to either get greater or less magnification. So the image on the left, it's set at 28, it zoomed all the way out. And you can see the image on the right, I've turned it up to 105 millimeters and you can see that the lens is actually extended. That means that the subject I'm looking at is going to be more magnified. The difference here is, is that regardless of whether I'm zoomed out or zoomed in, the camera will capture the image using the entire sensor. With digital zoom, basically the camera crops the image down and only uses part of the sensor. And to illustrate that, what I've done is I've put my camera on a tripod. This is the phone camera here, the iPhone. And I've taken a photograph of a stink bug. And then what I did, was I zoomed in using the digital zoom on the camera. And there's either a little slider bar or you can put your fingers on the screen and kind of stretch the screen and that will zoom in. And then I took another photograph. And then lastly, what I did is I went back to that original photograph, I put it in Photoshop, I enlarged it and cropped it to 100%. The resulting file size was 725 kilobytes which is exactly the resulting file size of the digital zoom photo using the iPhone. So what the iPhone digital zoom does is it just simply does exactly the same thing I did. It enlarges the photo to 100% and it crops the image, but it does it in the camera before you take the picture. Now I'm not saying don't use digital zoom, just understand what it is. You're not actually getting in any magnification or more information. So the image on the right was generated from the image on the left. And there is exactly the same as if I had used the digital zoom. Now there are some times when that digital zoom is handy, but again, just be aware of what it is and how you're using it. Okay, focus. This is the single biggest problem I see with diagnostic images is that the subject is out of focus and consequently I can't help the person that sent the photo in. They send in something that looks like the photo on the right and I can only say, well, it looks like a stink bug and that's it. And this is very, very important especially in this case. So you look at that image on the right, yeah, I can tell you it's a stink bug, but I can't tell you what species it is. And that's very important. The image on the left is in focus and I can see the white banding on the antennae. I can see the white marks alternating with black around the abdomen. And I can tell you that that is a brown marmorated stink bug. And that is a serious pest. It's not one that we've detected here in North Dakota yet, uh, but it's one that we are keeping an eye out for. So that it's, that's very important that your subject be in focus. 
And in just a little bit, I'll show you a couple of techniques that you can use to ensure that you do get an image that is in focus. To a lesser extent, exposure is a problem. Digital cameras and exposure, the older digital cameras had a tough time with exposure, but just in the last few years, digital cameras have come a long ways in getting the correct exposure. And it's always been a problem where there's a lot of white either in the subject or in the background. So here's a snowy owl I had found uh, a few years ago and I was able to photograph. The image on the left is underexposed. You can see that the white isn't really white. The blue sky is gray, it just looks dark. Um, you can still see some detail though. The center image has got a proper exposure. The whites are white. Now the owl was lit from the side so you can see part of the owl is in sunlight, part of it is in shade but everything looks right. And the sky is kind of a pale blue. This was taken in the evening of a, a winter day. The image on the right is overexposed. The sky is completely washed out to white. You can't even see the right-hand outline of the owl anymore. It's so overexposed. Now, digital cameras will have a tendency to underexpose. And that's better than having something that's overexposed. Those pixels on the right, on the overexposed image, all that white, all, any detail is lost. I can't recover it. An underexposed photo, I can put into Photoshop and adjust the exposure, and then I can see some of that detail that may have otherwise been lost. But try to get the exposure right in the camera, and I'll show you how to do that here in just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to walk through a, a demonstration of focus and exposure on the iPhone. The principles here, again, are the same as they are for the Android. Okay, I have here a little leaf cutter B, and you can kind of see that tic-tac-toe grid on the screen there, and that helps me to compose my photo. Now, to focus with the iPhone, all you got to do is just tap the screen. You can see that little square that came up. That will focus right at it, that exact point. Now, if I don't like the exposure, what I can do is instead of just tapping once on the screen, I can put my finger on and hold. And you can see what just happened. That AEAF lock just came up. That's auto exposure autofocus. And if you look closely on the right hand side of the square, kind of by the tip of the pin on the right hand side, there's a little sun symbol. And I can adjust the exposure. You can see the sun symbol moving. So I can adjust until I get the exposure just right. And then I can go ahead and capture the image. When doing close-up photography, it is very important to keep the camera steady. What you can see here, I've got the iPhone mounted on a little tabletop tripod that's got flexible legs, so I can position the legs to help me uh, get a, a good photograph. And the head of that will also pivot 360 degrees, and it will actually move 90 degrees downward, so I could get it parallel to the surface of the table. Also note that there's a cord coming out of the lightning port. What that is, it's an, an old pair of headphones that I don't use anymore. So I just cut the buds off the headphone, but I kept the volume buttons. You can see those circled in red there at the bottom. That acts as a remote shutter. So when that's plugged in, the camera automatically senses it. I don't have to adjust any other settings and I can use either volume button to capture a photo. That's really important in close-up still photography because if you have to tap the screen to take the photo, you might jar the camera and that might result in your subject being out of focus. So I highly recommend that you use a remote shutter when doing close-up photography. A nice thing about this little tripod is that the head is removable and it has a one quarter inch uh, screw receiver on the bottom. So I can mount that on any other tripod. That quarter inch screw is pretty standard. On the right, you can see I've got it mounted on a bigger tripod. 
That's a tripod has telescoping legs. I can adjust it from two to six feet tall and the legs will splay out. So it actually will be almost flat on the ground. And with that pan head on there, I can move the, the phone around and the camera with it. And so I can take pictures of at just about any angle of anything I want to. It's very handy. So I do highly recommend if you're, you're doing close up photography, use a tripod, use a remote shutter. That'll help solve those uh, focus problems. Another common problem I see is that the subject and the camera were not on the same plane when the photograph was taken. And what that means is that part of the subject will be in focus, part of it will not be in focus. So watch your focal plane. So in this case, I have the stink bug, it's flat on the work surface and I've adjusted my tripod so that the camera is parallel to the stink bug itself. That way the entire top of the stink bug is in focus. So keep an eye on the focal plane that'll help you to get better quality photos with the subject in focus. You can also keep the subject itself steady. Uh, if you're taking a photograph of say a plant in situ and the wind is blowing as it does here in North Dakota, try to keep the plant itself steady. I carry around some bamboo stakes some tape and some rubber coated wire. And so I can put those next to the plant, kind of wrap up or tape up the plant to the stakes. That'll keep it steady in the wind and then I can take a photograph. A lot of times we'll see photographs of leaves, particularly with disease lesions. Here's a buckthorn leaf with a oat crown rust on it. Buckthorn is an alternate host for that pathogen. And you can see what I've done here is I've clipped the leaf off and just taped it to a piece of white cardstock. And I've got my camera so that it's parallel to the leaf itself and I've taken the picture. And as long as we're on the subject here, another common mistake that we see is photographs being sent in that don't have any kind of scale associated with them. And that's particularly critical for tiny insects or disease lesions on leaves like in this case. So if you can place a penny or even better yet, get a small plastic ruler, place that right next to the subject, that helps us to uh, diagnose the problem because we can actually see the size of, of what we're talking about here. Lighting is another problem. Uh, you want to avoid backlighting at all costs. A backlighting is when the subject is lit from the back and usually what you'll see is bright light in the background and the subject will, itself will be completely dark. So you want to avoid that. Uh, but there's, there's times when you're going to have side lighting or some very harsh direct lighting or as in the picture here on the left, you actually get in the way. That's my own shadow. I'm taking a picture of some tree bark here. What you can do is use the built-in flash in your camera. So what I've done on the image on the right is I've actually used my own body shadow to block the, the light coming into the tree bark. And then I used the flash on my camera to take the photograph. And that eliminated all of the, the shadows, the harsh highlights, and the result is actually a pretty good photo. So don't be afraid to use the flash that's built into your camera. Our cell phones have really excellent flash, especially at close range. Now, if you're like me and you do have some problems adjusting and, and using a smartphone camera, particularly for close-ups, don't be afraid to use a other digital camera. Uh, don't despair. You can take the SD card out of that camera, plug it into an SD card reader. If you have an iPhone, you're really limited to this particular one here. It's You can see the plug-in is for the lightning port. iPhones don't have USB ports like, like the Android phones do. But I can take that SD card from my digital camera, use the card reader, plug that into my iPhone and import any photos to my iPhone using this device. Once they're on the iPhone, then I can either email or text them wherever they need to go. If you have any questions at all about the material that we've talked about here today, feel free to reach out to me via email patrick.bose at ndsu.edu. Mm -hmm.